And with that said, so I'm Dina Misachi. I teach the Wizard of Oz at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. And my big claim to fame right now, or 15 minutes of it, is I was just in that American Experience Oz documentary. And so I'm horribly and shamelessly taking advantage of this 15 minutes to get to talk with some ladies who way outpace me on all things, especially Matilda Gage. So thank you so much, Angelica and Gita, for joining me. I'll let you introduce yourselves because you'll do a much better job than I could. Gita, you want to start us off? You want, who do you want to start? <laughs> you go ahead. I'll start. Um, my name is Gita Dorothy Morena, and Matilda Jocelyn Gage is my great-great-grandmother. So I'll be sharing with you. I'm a, I'm a psychotherapist. I've been a psychotherapist my whole life. I do a fair amount of writing and teaching and have a private practice in San Diego. So I always look through th at things through a, a more psychological perspective. So I'll be sharing with you some of my, my memories of the family and what we talked about with Matilda. And then we'll get into the discussion in varying ways. So. Uh, it's nice to see you all. It's nice to see new faces involved with Oz. I haven't met a lot of you, so it's wonderful to be here. So thank you. Angelica. Okay. <laughs> Hi, everybody. My name is Angelica Shirley Carpenter, and I'm a former librarian. Um, now I'm a writer, but I'm an always, uh, my whole life has been devoted to Oz. No kidding. I was born to Oz. I'm a third generation Oz fan in my family. Um, I won't bore you with all of the details, but it just seems I didn't know when I was a child that Oz would just shape my entire career. Um, I've been president of the Oz Club and I have written three books about, I tell Gita, I feel like I'm part of her family. I wrote one book about my family and three about hers. Um, and in my, um, former life as a librarian, of course, that was a lot of fun and also very Aussie. Any library I worked in had Oz programs, Oz exhibitions, you know, Oz summer reading programs. It's, it's just amazing to me what, what has come of my childhood interest in Oz. And I am so glad to be here today. And I'll echo uh, Gita and say how nice to see new people who I don't know. I hope to meet you in person next summer. So I think both Angelica and Gita are being a little too modest because they are both a lot more fabulous than they're giving themselves credit for. And one thing that came up that thematically was in common is both of you have a family connection to Oz. Gita's is pretty obvious, but Angelica, you didn't really get into, uh, or you got into writing Oz because of your mother. I did. Um... My mother, Jean Shirley, was a childhood Oz fan, and she inherited Oz books from her uncle, Gordon Jenkins, who just by coincidence grew up to be um, a conductor, arranger, composer, and worked a lot with Judy Garland. And he was a lifelong Oz fan. My mother was a lifelong Oz fan, but I am the family's first Oz nut, I would say, just you know, way over the top about Oz. And I wrote a book with my mother, L. Frank Baum, Royal Historian of Oz. That was um, our second book that we wrote together. So that was a real labor of love and really fun to do together. And Gita, obviously you have a family Oz connection, but you're also so very established all on your own. How does it work out that you both have a doctorate and then also end up the family representation? Well, I probably should start at the beginning. You know, um, my great-great-grandmother was Matilda and Matilda's youngest daughter married L. Frank. So she is my, Maud is my great-grandmother. And that is the grandmother of my mother who was, who was uh, let's see, let me, get, let me get this straight now. My mother was their first granddaughter. And when she was born, L. Frank named her Ozma. So Ozma is my mother. 
the Princess of Oz. That was always a big deal. When, when my mother got married, she gave birth to me. I was her first daughter and she named me Dorothy. So I kind of lived inside that story. As I was little, the Wizard of Oz was, was sort of my world. And I imagined myself as Dorothy, very literally, I had the name. My mother was the Princess of Oz. It was like I lived in that fairy tale. And then, and then as, I, as I started to ask questions, you know, it was really clear that Matilda became the part of me that, that was more connected with sort of who I am. And Dorothy was this role that I have taken on in the world. So when I started to get into psychology, people were of course really interested in the Wizard of Oz and the understanding of the Wizard of Oz from a psychological perspective. And they wanted me to write about it and they wanted me to teach about it. And I started doing that 40 years ago now to that professional community. So I've taught all around the world about the Wizard of Oz and the meaning of it. So for me, it's like, it's like somehow I'm in this position of bringing more consciousness and more awareness to Dorothy, to what her story really means for us. You know, the, the world has gotten so, uh, developed so quickly in the last hundred years and it's gotten so chaotic and so disturbed. And I think through the, through the years with world wars and you know, all kinds of, of innovations, Looking, working on the computer like this is so new. And I think we're really disoriented psychologically and need a way to find a connection to ourselves to get more centered and more grounded. And I think this story really does that. I think it through the fairy tale, through the entertainment of it all, through the movie, it's just captured the psyche of Americans and gives us a way to connect with ourselves that's, that's really meaningful and needed so much. So that's sort of how I linked from Oz into psychology and, and sort of woven those two aspects of myself together. Matilda's really given me a way to connect with, with who I am and the energy of this family. Her, her uh, ancestors through her father signed the Magna Carta in England. They've been revolutionaries and, and active politically for freedom and equality and justice in their environments for generations now. The Magna Carta was signed in 1266. They came to America and fought in the Revolutionary War. So we have this huge family legacy of really active, uh, innovative uh, people defending the right of individuals to be who they are and have equality and have freedom. So, you know, Matilda's uh, tombstone, she had the words put on, there's a word sweeter than mother, home, and heaven, and that word is liberty. So that's a big theme through the whole family. So before we get too far, and certainly we will, <laughs> let's go to very much square one. Who is Matilda Jocelyn Gage? So Gita, you want to start us off and explain that? Well, I can just tell you some of my family stories. It, that question made me think about what did I learn about Matilda as a kid? And, and one of the first stories that I really remember is that Matilda used to live with L. Frank and Maud and their children. And, and he started telling this story to the neighborhood children. He, was, he loved to still tell stories to the kids. They lived in Chicago for uh, when the kids were young and, and all the kids in the neighborhood would come over to hear the bombs, hear L. Frank tell stories at bedtime. And they would send a constable at nine o'clock to collect the kids and return them back home. And the story I heard was one of these was, was the Wizard of Oz story. And the kids wanted to hear about Dorothy and they wanted to hear what the name of the land was. And the evolution of the Wizard of Oz story came out of answering the children's questions. And that Matilda was there while this was going on and really encouraged Frank to write this story down. So she and Maud both said, this one needs to be written. And this was, you know, Matilda died in 1898. So this was um, sort of at the end of her life. And he was just starting to get this story 
organized in his head, I think, as he was telling it to kids. So that, that was really impressive to me. And then I found out she had a station on the Underground Railroad. And that was mind blowing, that she was willing to, to provide sanctuary for slaves that were trying to uh, gain their freedom and move north. So when I went to the Gage Foundation now is a, is a foundation that Sally Roche Wagner has developed for Matilda Gage in Fayetteville. And I've been to the home and been in the basement and seen where she harbored runaway slaves. She was raised by uh, a man who also, uh, her father also was a, had a station on the Underground Railroad. So that was familiar to her from her childhood. And then of course, you know, my, my parents, my mother was very proud of Matilda's ability to write, all the presentations she did, her active political work. Uh, she wrote Women, Church and State. You were, you were just talking about it. Here's the, a recent edition of it. Um, so, uh, and that she really, you know, fought for women's rights to vote and how important that was that she was, was writing with Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, that she was involved with writing the history of women's suffrage, those first few volumes. So she was a very active and, and political woman that was highly respected and regarded. She was really involved with the Native American uh, community, the no Mohawk tribe, the Haudenosaunee uh, nation, and a lot of her ideas about women's suffrage came from that uh, group. So that was always interesting to me and to learn about. And then it was also really interesting that she was a theosophist. So theosophy was bringing, was bringing uh, Eastern thinking and contemplative practices into America. And Matilda was very involved with that whole movement. She joined that group, Al Frank and Maude joined that group. So there's such this connection in our family of kind of metaphysical thinking and palm reading and tarot reading. I often do a tarot reading at the Gage Institute when I, when I go there. Um, it's part of what, what I'm able to do for people. So there's this familiarity with the world of spirit and this ease with moving between the concrete reality and the world of spirit that I think is really demonstrated in, in Oz's, Oz's work. Enough. <laughs> no, no, no. You're I could go on and on, but you have to stop me. <laughs> we all could go on and on. The elevator pitch version of Gage that I always give my students, because, you know, I only get to cover this much Gage in a course on the Wizard of Oz, is that Matilda Gage hung out with Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. They wrote together, they protested together, they bailed each other out of jail. And then Matilda said, hey, you know what? Women aren't getting right cause, rights because of the church. And the other two said, you can't say this. We'll never get the right to vote. And she's right. like, eh, I'm going to say it anyway. And they're like, OK, we're done now. So anyone who doesn't know Angelica Carpenter, Angelica has saved me many a time. I remember very clearly my very first Oz conference. I was giving a little talk on woman, church, and state. And somebody asked me a question that I was woefully unprepared for. And Angelica, bless her, I will never, ever forget this and love you forever. You stood up and very delicately said, would it be OK if I answered that? And it took me everything not to run off stage and hug you because I was ready to run away and cry. And so now that I've given my little elevator speech, how would you correct that for us? Well, I, I take her more from um you know, an outside point of view. I don't have the family insights that, that Peter does, but studying her, you know, um, her father was quite a remarkable person, quite a liberal. And he, all three really big movements of the early 1800s, temperance, women's rights and abolition kind of borrowed from each other. And Matilda started off in abolition. And then when she got to be a teenager, she realized that the problem that the enslaved people had was pretty similar to the problems that women had, which was that they had no rights. Um, and she went on, couldn't be a doctor because she was a woman, um, but she went on to be just a superb organizer. Um, she worked on like grassroots foundations for 
women's organizations, um, first in New York State, and then she went down to Virginia. And, you know, she just had a really keen sense of organization and how you would build things from the grassroots up. And you would pick workers to do your um, important work, not people with big names or celebrities. Um, and then she was a wonderful writer. I read Women, Church, and State when I was writing my book, Born Criminal, and I was just amazed at how good it was. Eric Shanauer told me it was a really good book, and I didn't believe him, but it really is a good book. Um, so she was a wonderful writer, and um, I think at the end of her life, I mean, she was right up there with Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, and the falling out that they had over religion especially saddened her because actually Stanton felt exactly the way she did about religion, but she was more political than Matilda. She realized that she couldn't say re religion had oppressed women and was a terrible thing the way Matilda did. Um, so she sided with Anthony, even though Stanton didn't believe that. And I think that hurt Matilda more than anything else. Um, I think if Matilda were here today, she would be right in the forefront of uh, radical women's movement, um, fighting for abortion rights, equal pay. You know, we still don't have an equal rights amendment and they were introducing them back in the 1880s. Uh, she would be right up there with some of the most radical women leaders that we have. And she would still be shocking people, I'm sure. And she'd be enjoying all that too. So speaking of radical women leaders, where do we see Gage's influence on Baum and his Oz work? Well, certainly it's a, a land run by the women. You know, it's, it's Glinda overseeing the whole perspective. It's Ozma doing the day-to-day. -day. It's Dorothy doing the, the adventure and the problem solving and the dealing with sort of the nitty gritty. I mean, you really see you really see the women coming to the foreground in so many ways. You know, Dorothy's a very feminine heroine. She doesn't pull out her sword and attack people. She tries to communicate. She tries to resolve problems and differences. I think that really comes a lot from, from Matilda's awareness of what the feminine really is and how needed it really is. So I think that's one place that it really comes through. And I think it really comes through her experience with theosophy, you know, just the whole ease of the spirit world and the, the back and forth between the spirit world and the concrete reality that we have to juggle all the time, that she really uh, was masterful with that and influenced Frank, I think, in the writing of The Wizard of Oz. And you really see it throughout the story. So I think those are, those are some of the ways that it influences. So wait, before we move on, I know for those of you who were there, Erica gave a presentation on theosophy a couple Ozcoms ago, but for anyone who missed it, can you just define theosophy for us real quick? What is it? Oh my gosh. Well, theosophy <laughs> is a movement that, that, that Madame Blavatsky really brought to America, but it's bringing Eastern thinking into Western culture, basically. So it really involves uh, respect for diversity. It involves just what, what Baum brought out in the Wizard of Oz, wisdom, compassion, and courage that are represented in those three characters, the scarecrow, the cowardly lion, and the tin woodman, come right out of of the values of theosophy and getting connected with yourself, finding home inside yourself is a very Eastern concept that I think was implied and comes through the, the theosophical movement. So they really emphasized meditation. They emphasized really having a global view of uh, understanding about what's going on so that it includes oppositions and, and conflicts and finds resolution for those things in its perspective. And I think I didn't, I know very little about theosophy and, and Madame Vladivatsky or whatever her name is um, puts me to sleep. But when I was studying it, I, I mean, I did pick up a little. And for instance, uh, an adept is a title for somebody who's good in, who does a particular thing in theosophy. So the three adepts of magic in of magic at Glinda of Oz, that's, that's a concept that 
Hal Frank Baum wouldn't have gotten if he didn't have Matilda in his life. He would not have been into theosophy. Um, there's so many things in the books that, that make you see Matilda. For instance, um, he makes fun of all the male armies but female soldiers are organized and efficient. Even if they're taking over the Emerald City, they're doing it in an organized way. Um, there's the argument about whether to eat bugs or chickens and that reflects to me in, in Ozma of Oz, Belina and Dorothy are discussing what to eat. Um, and Matilda was a vegetarian and L. Frank Mom loved meat. So I think this conversation kind of echoes. I love to think about them writing under the same roof and she's writing this radical, um, you know, attacks on organized religion, and he's writing fairy tales, and then they come down to dinner together. I love that idea. But, but one of the things I've been struck with most lately is, is the idea of abolition. I mean, Matilda really began her activism as an abolitionist. As a child, she went door to door in Cicero, New York, to get signatures on anti-slavery petitions. And one of the, um, well, I'm reading, I'm writing an article about the Gnome King for you, um, for a book we're working on together. And one of, the, I'm sorry, one of, the, <laughs> one of the articles I read was just so interesting because it said the theme of Oz is abolition, you know? These heroines go into, they go up against the Gnome King or whoever, and they rescue people, they break enchantments, they, you know, and it's abolition. It's about abolition. That's, and, and it certainly reflects on the fact that L. Frank Baum was a child during the Civil War and lived through, you know, abolition. So I think he definitely got influenced by Matilda in his thinking about abolition. In Ozma of Oz, when um, they're trying to free the Queen of Ev and her 10 children, um, the Gnome King says, he, he's, He's bought them fair and square, they're his. Well, that's an argument that early abolitionists even used. They said, if you're going to free the enslaved people, you're gonna to have to pay their owners, owners for their loss of property. Um, so I think definitely that Matilda's experience with abolition influenced Baum's uh, thinking forever. What other characters do we see that might, so, I know you just reviewed for the Bugle this book, I have way down here, Amazons in America, and it suggests that Glinda is Matilda Gage. And what we talked a little bit about this and aren't so sure about how accurate that what might be, but where do we see Gage in some of Baum's characters? And also, Gita, I know we're gonna veer just a smidge off, but I couldn't help it in your book, which I was just rereading, I noticed that you talk about Grandma Bomb as scraps. And I'm very curious, was Grandma Bob um, Maud? And can you talk a little bit about that, even though it's just slightly off our Matilda topic? Well, let me, let me, let me answer your first thing first. <laughs> um, because what I think of when I, when I think of the connection is uh, the character of Ginger. And I, and you know, Baum was, loved to do puns. He loved to joke with people. He loved, you know, mother talked about that part of him. She talked about it in her own father. Um, so here's Ginger who's going to fight the army and she pulls out her knitting needles and she knocks the scarecrow off the throne and then she does nothing. You know, she just wants to, to not be a leader at all. And, and that he kind of pokes fun at Matilda and the whole woman's movement, I think, with the character of Ginger. And then I also think about uh, uh, Princess Guinevere, you know, who has these multiple different heads and puts on different heads that, that, that perhaps Frank's, Frank was seeing how multitask oriented we are. We have all these, as women, we have all these different roles we play. And he kind of makes fun of it. And she's not a pleasant woman and she's, she gets very abusive and, and not fun, but, but you see his, his sort of poking at, at the other side of women that they always, you know, that he sees it all. So I think that's kind of fun to recognize in that first, in, the, in those stories. 
Now we know that Matilda Gage and L. Pringbaum kind of got a rough start. They didn't love each other at the beginning. That's Do you think right. that that plays into the poking fun at all? I think it's part of, I think they're both very strong and very direct. I think Maude was, you know, when, when Maude decided to marry Al Frank, Al Frank was a, an actor and Maude had planned on, I mean, Matilda had planned on her daughter being a lawyer and taking over her legacy. So when she falls in love with an actor and it's, you know, he hasn't been educated and Matilda's not very happy about it. And and they go to Matilda and to announce that they're getting married. And Matilda says, well, I'm not going to have my daughter marry, you know, an actor. And Maude says, well, goodbye, mother, and gets ready to leave. And that's, Matilda says, wait a minute. And they both start laughing. She says, what do you mean? And she says, well, if you're, if you're not going to, you know, support me, I, I'm going to go do this thing. So they laugh together and they, you know, begin to be, you know, Matilda was very supportive of her daughter and their family and all of that. So they, they certainly had a good relationship. Matilda lived with the bombs at the end of her life and died in the bombs home. So there was really a closeness, but I'm sure there was also a fire that happened between them. And I think it's really fun to see that because they're both fiery people. They're both very outspoken. You know, I think of Matilda's energy is coming through Dorothy. You know, Dorothy's a really strong, strong woman who faces all of these hardships and figures it out. In the book, she really has to solve the problems with her friends. Glinda doesn't uh, come to her rescue. So, so I really, you know, sort of see the, the strength that she embodies and that, that strength is Matilda's energy really is the way I see it. And I think when they started off, um, well, of course, L. Frank Baum was probably intimidated by Matilda because she was quite famous and he was a young man who was just getting started in life. But um, he really worked at being charming to her and he was really charming, <laughs> but I think he worked at it harder with her. And I also think that when his children were young, um, after, after the second son, Maude was ill and sick in bed. I'm, yeah, Maud for two years. And I'm sure that L. Frank Baum was a more active father than most fathers were at that time because his wife was so ill. Anyway, Matilda just writes about him in her letters in such a loving way and reports on all the fun things he did and what he's calling the baby and what, what Christmas presents they had. And um, it's clear to me that, that he was a wonderful father. And I know that from reading Matilda's letters. Um, and then at the end of her life, when she's really dying, she writes about how kind he's always been to her. And he was traveling then as a salesman and he would always come in and kiss her goodbye. So certainly, I mean, I don't think she disliked him for any personal reason. She just thought he didn't have the right education and job, but certainly over time, they really became very close, I think. Yeah, I think that's true. And I, you know, when he wrote the editorials in, when he was in Aberdeen, he made comments that the, the fathers should really spend more time staying home with their kids and then women should go out and be more involved in the outside world and the running of the nation. So that was really a strong, strong belief of his and a strong value of his to, for the men to be involved and, and take care of the kids. And if we're talking about Matilda's influence in Oz, I also want to mention Matilda's influence in Aunt Jane's nieces. Oh, good. Um, if you all have ever read Aunt Jane's nieces, there's a lot of L. Frank Baum's personal life. This one is Aunt Jane's nieces on vacation from 1912, and they run a newspaper in a small town. Now, it's true, L. Frank Baum run, ran a newspaper in Aberdeen, but Matilda also ran a newspaper from uh, Fayetteville. I'm, I don't know if all the operations were right in Fayetteville, but certainly he knew that a woman could run a local newspaper and he had stories from her to, to bear it out. And then even funnier than that, this one is called Aunt Jane's Nieces at Work and it's from 1909. And I was just um, 
brushing up on my L. Frank Baum this morning, and I found a passage in it. Aunt Jane's nieces are three cousins, um, Beth, Louise, and Patsy. And in this book, their sort of cousin, Kenneth, is um, thinking about running for state representative in New York. And they're trying to decide whether to go help him. Now, remember, this is 1909. Women can't vote. And so they're trying to decide, you know, should they go? Should they work on a campaign? And Patsy's father says, put on some blue stockings, read the history of women's suffrage, cultivate a liking for depraved eggs, and then face Kenneth's enraged constituents. Now, I don't know what enraged eggs are, depraved eggs. I don't know what that is. But certainly, read the history of women's suffrage. I think we're talking about Matilda <laughs> right there. Mm -hmm. And Matilda did um, actually unseat a governor in New York. Um, there was a, a, I forget what year it was, but there was a, um, a bill that passed the New York legislature giving women the right to vote in school elections. And the governor vetoed it and said it was against human nature for women to vote or something like that. So she decided it was against women human nature to have him as governor and she launched a big campaign to defeat him and it, it worked she got him voted out and she couldn't vote but she did the things that the girls in this book do she talked to wives who talked to their husbands she put up signs she made speeches and that governor was defeated and the next governor who came in signed the bill <laughs> and Matilda got to vote that was the first time she got to vote was in a school election mm -hmm. Do we see anything in Baum's work that we think Matilda Gage wouldn't agree with? Well, I see him poking fun at uh, higher education and Matilda worshiped higher education and really fought to get into it herself and wasn't allowed in, but actually um, she educated herself. She just went on reading and studying and. So he makes jokes of, you know, the Royal Athletic College where they take pills to learn their class, the, their subjects, and then it gives them more time for athletics. But again, it's really a gentle kind of teasing. I mean, I think if Matilda had heard that, she would think he was poking fun at her, the same as with um, Ginger and women's suffrage. You know, the other piece is, you know, I'm, I'm gonna go there into, you know, he, when he wrote, uh, in his editorials about Sitting Bull. And Matilda was such a supporter of the indigenous, the Native American uh, culture. I think that probably would have been really hard for her that, that he said that. Um, and I think it really reflected a conflict that he was feeling internally, you know, that he was supportive of Sitting Bull. Sam is a great great leader and a great culture. And then his fear of what was going on that he picked up from other people and all that was going on around the ghost dances and the drought that was happening, that, that he, it really shows his conflict. And I, I think that probably would have been difficult for Matilda to have, have had to deal with. And they were, you know, having dinners together and, and spending time together. So I'm sure it came up as part of the conversation um, and, and I don't, it was never talked about in my family, so I don't really know. It's just total speculation about that, but I would guess that was one of their conversations and maybe one of their sort of having to, to tussle out what was really going on um, around that time, because it was such a big, such a big thing that was happening in our country. You know, my cousin and I, went up to Pine Ridge and met with survivors of Wounded Knee and talked to them and, you know, apologized as much as you can for someone from the past as an effort to, to learn from the mistakes, to learn from what we've done in the past, all of us in our history, um, so that we don't continue that kind of thinking, that we, we learn how to be more congruent with the values that we have. So I, I think that was, was part of what, what was dealt with between Matilda and, and Frank. I appreciate you bringing that up, Gita. I had to, I'm, I know we talked about it, but it's like, oh, we have to, we have to mention this, yeah. So what are, we see a lot of examples, Gage is kind of re-emerging now. We went through a number of years of 
having her kind of written out of history. Now she seems to be making her way back. And I know Angelica spoke a little bit about that when we talked the other day. So I'll let you catch us up on how she's coming back. And then I'd be curious to hear, what do we think of the examples we're seeing of Gage Tay? Like what would Gage feel about Let's's book, Finding Dorothy. But before you answer that, Angelica, catch us up on how Matilda Gage is re-emerging. <laughs> okay, well, um, she really started re-emerging in the six, late 60s and early 70s when the women's movement had like a second blooming. And a lot of scholars found Matilda at that point. And um, I forget who, Dale Spender, an Australian scholar, I think said, what, this woman, the most radical person in Victorian times was saying all these things, why didn't we know? So that really started an interest in Matilda, I think. Um, and then in, I believe in the 80s, Margaret Rossiter was a scientist who coined a term, the Matilda effect, which what referred to the fact that male scientists and other male experts took credit for women's work. And um, this was, just recently in uh, 2019, it was an article in the Smithsonian Magazine. I know Matilda would just be thrilled. Um, it was like a four page feature article about the Matilda effect and how men take credit for women's work. So it's, you know, it's beginning. Um, and more and more books like this, well, it's not a surprise Sally Rush Wagner writes about Matilda, but this is a history of the women's suffrage movement. It definitely includes Matilda. Um, I'm a little more tuned into children's literature, but like books like this, anthologies for children are now including Matilda as an important figure in the women's movement. There's some game or a, I think a jigsaw puzzle that's a circle that has all these famous feminists and Matilda is one of them. So I, I really think she is getting better known. Oh, and in, in that TV show that you were just um, on, American experience, you know, there was, they talked a lot about Matilda on that show. So I think it's not just Matilda, I think many other people who made differences in our country are being studied now. And there's a real effort to be more inclusive and to look to, it's not just Martin Luther King who fought for civil rights. And it's not just Cesar Chavez who felt fought for farm workers rights. There were other people involved too, but I think Americans, it's easy for us to just look at Susan B. Anthony and think that's the women's movement, but she's not, she's not the only one. And um, goodness knows, I mean, Matilda is so worth investigating, you know? Right. And while we're talking about children's books that talk about Matilda and here's Angelica being far too humble. So I'm going <laughs> to hold up a couple. We have Angelica's young adult biography. But we also have the picture book that you just did. Tell the story of the picture book, Angelica. Oh, OK. Well, first I wrote Born Criminal, which, as she said, was um, published as a young adult biography, but only because that's just what the publisher decided to do. It's all full of footnotes and whatever. And um, anyway, it's I love a great it. book about Matilda's life. The, the research that you've done with it was wonderful. It's documented well. I really appreciate it. You know. yeah. So for people like me that are trying to do things like this, how does one go about researching a book like that? <laughs> well, I was, um, I, I mostly use primary, or what do they call it? Yeah, primary sources like Matilda's letters. I was able to borrow on microfilm from the Schlesinger Library. It took me months to read her letters. Her handwriting was terrible. Yes. Um, I read her books. I read her newspaper, the National Citizen and Ballot Box. I read the journals and letters of Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and a lot of other people who lived at the same time as Matilda. And um, I just had a wonderful time. Of course, it only took me eight years to write that book. You know, <laughs> it was a long time, but but so I mean, I'm I'm very proud of it. And and one of the things I wrote about one of the chapters was that Matilda and her friend Lily Devereux Blake staged a demonstration with the New York State Women's Suffrage Association at, at the 1886 de dedication of the Statue of Liberty. Now, you know, why would anybody protest the Statue of Liberty? 
the, the reason was they thought it was a beautiful statue. They had no problem with the statue, but they didn't think that liberty should be a woman in the United States where women had no freedom and not even the right to vote. And what really stuck that in my mind was I, um, they, had rented, they had to rent a boat to sail in this naval parade. And the only boat they could get was a real smelly cattle barge. And the captain promised them that he would have the bar barge cleaned before these 200 women got on, but he didn't. So when they got there on a terrible, cold, rainy, windy day, the barge just reeked. And I just had this picture of these elegantly dressed women, and Matilda was always very well dressed, walking onto this boat and holding their noses. I could not get that out of my head. And, and that was a picture book. And somebody said earlier, before we started this formal panel, that anniversaries spark publishing. Well, that's certainly true for me because the South Dakota Historical Society Press published Born Criminal First in celebration of the centennial of the 19th Amendment and the Voice of Liberty next, although that came out during the pandemic. But anyway, that, that was because of the anniversary of 100 years of women's, most women, right? not enough women having the right to vote. So I imagine you didn't just, I don't know, pop open your browser and start Googling things. How does one find primary source documents? Well, you read one book and especially you look at bibliographies and you see um, Sally Rose Wagner, of course, I read her dissertation, which was from the 70s. She's one of, she is the person who discovered Matilda in the 70s and has made a career out of studying Matilda. And so as you read what, an article or a, there weren't many books. There was only one book about Matilda that was a, a scholarly book about her role in the women's movement, nothing about her family particularly. But as you read one thing, it leads you to another and you read the bibliographies and that leads you to more. And the trouble for me is stopping. <laughs> this is called research rapture, okay? It's the real danger. And, you know, I had like 500 pages of notes for Matilda, and they're all in chronological order. I take notes in Word. Well, 500 pages is enough, you know? You don't really need any more. But here's the truth. Once you write about somebody, whether it's L. Frank Baum or Matilda, you just go on doing it. I mean, people ask you to write other parts of it, or um, like I wrote that article about Maud for the Baum Bugle recently. You never stop, so you never stop doing the research, but at some point you have to say, done, you're done doing your research, get out there and write that chapter. So it's fun, it keeps me off the streets. And <laughs> it's a really good thing to do during COVID. <laughs> Not good to have a book come out during COVID, but to write one, that's a really good activity. All right, I'm veering off just a smidge from our Matilda Gage. I really want to go back to this uh, Grandma Baum and Scraps. Gita, can you tell us a little bit? Oh, yeah, bit? well, I, don't, I haven't heard Grandma Baum so much in Scraps, but my mother's favorite character was Scraps. And at one point, she even used that as her nickname. And she just loved this character. And I'm starting to, to write more and sort of fall in love with scraps myself now who's this you know she's she just represents so much of who we are all these different varied experiences and life experiences and how we put all that together and it enlivens us and out of that we 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 engage with life and you see her her really come to life uh certainly in my mother so i i didn't hear it as a family story that maud identified with patchwork girl but certainly my mother so Ozma really, really is who I think of when I think of the patchwork girl. And I have one more also about your mother. Forgive me, please. Yes. The Ozma locket, who has it? Oh, yes. So, <laughs> you know, when, when my mother was born, she was L. Frank's first granddaughter. And the parents, his youngest son, and he married a woman named Dorothy. They took the baby to meet their parents, L. Frank, and he said, and they had named her Frances. And he says, oh no, her name's not Frances. Her name is Ozma and gives her a locket with her, that's inscribed with her name. And my mother wore that her whole life. And when she died, she passed it to her first granddaughter, who is my brother's daughter. 
Megan. So that's, she has it. That is very cool. It is very cool. I was hoping you had it hiding somewhere. I was giving you like, I, I must wish I did. <laughs> it was a little hard to see that locket go, but I, I understood, you know. What I have, which is a real treasure, is a piece of the wedding fabric that comes from Matilda's great grandmother, who was married in Scotland to uh, 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 nobility in Scotland and saved a piece of the wedding fabric. So that has been passed down through Matilda to my mother, to me. So it's, it's a real treasure of this feminine lineage that has passed through Matilda and is really part of the whole legacy. It's, it's really a treasure. Oh, so that is that's very piece. cool. That's <laughs> Before we end, I want to read, I want to, I want to read a quote, you know, Matilda was quite a visionary. And she really, I think, was writing to our generation, the seventh generation is going to be my grandchildren. So I think she's writing to us in this time. And I, I, is, is this a good time to read it? Or should we wait a little bit? Sure. Okay. Because um, I just want to share with you, she says, I see evidence of a conflict more severe than any yet fought by reformation or science. During the ages, no rebellion has been of like importance with that of women against the tyranny of church and state. None has had its far reaching effects. We note its beginning, its progress will overthrow every existing form of these institutions. Its end will be a regenerated world. I think she's talking about right now. And then she says, a brighter day is to come for the world, a day when the institutions of women's soul shall be accepted as part of humanity's spiritual wealth, when force shall step backward and love in reality will rule the teachings of religion. May women be strong with the ability and courage necessary to bring about this millennial time. That's Matilda speaking about what's going on in the world right now to us, really. So I, I, so just, I know we talked a little bit about this, but if Matilda were still here, what would she be doing right now? Well, I think Angelica really spoke to that a little bit earlier. You know, I'm sure she'd be thinking about what's going on with all the voting things that are happening and being sure that people have a right to vote. You know, that was her original or one of her big flags to wave was we need to have the right, all people need a, the right to speak about the government that we live with. So I'm sure she would be very involved with that. Um, I'm sure she would be too. And um, the, the effort seems to be to disenfranchise people of color. And Matilda was a person who really believed in equal rights for everybody. Um, I think she'd be out marching with Black Lives Matter and writing to her congressmen and senators are going to see them more likely because she did that too. She went right to the White House um, she would be on social media. She would still be a very radical feminist, even in this day and age. Uh, she believed in the right to abortion, um, birth control, you know, I mean, things that aren't resolved now. And, and that's just in America. In some parts of the world, women aren't allowed to read, go outside, travel, you know, there's a lot to be done. And, and I, I agree, Gita, I think she's speaking to us right now. So it looks like we're running pretty short on time. If folks want to learn more on their own, what do we recommend? We've said a lot of things and I'm Okay, well, I recommend it. Born Criminal. There you go, <laughs> absolutely. Um, I think the, the Gage website too, matildajossengage.org has a yep. lot of information and yep. that's a really good place to start because it has Oz information too. And yep. you know that's a place where you can start and then it points you to other places where you can read too. 
Absolutely. I know we talked a whole bunch about woman, church, and state. There is one that actually has an introduction by Sally Roche Wagner. Right. So I'm going to say if you're going to get woman, church, and state, look for the one that has the Sally Wagner introduction. Right. Good idea. Yeah, that's pretty widely available. Also, um, the history of women's suffrage, the first three volumes is what Matilda worked on, is available at Project Gutenberg. Um, and I really did try to read all of that. The books are like four or 500 pages long each. So volume one, two, and three, you're talking 1,200 pages. Um, it's just fascinating. I, I don't know who's got time for that, but if you do, you can get in and out of it. <laughs> and it, you don't have to even have the actual book because Project Gutenberg is right there. And we had a question, who published this? This is... Um... See, Humanity Books, which is an imprint of Prometheus Books. But I really, if you just go on Amazon and type in Woman, Church, and State, Wagner, it should come up. Right. And of course, there's the Oz Club. If you want to learn more about Oz and L. Frank Baum, that's a really great place to start in getting the Baum Bugle. I know I write for them. I know Angelica writes for them. I know we just had the Jesus. return of Michael Patrick Hearn writing for them. There's a, a book about Matilda, too. I'm trying to find it. Um, well, if I find it, I'll put it in the chat. And I mentioned Gita's book, but I'm going to shamelessly plug everybody. <laughs> so, Gita wrote The Wisdom of Oz. And this I, I had a lot of fun reading because it gets into a little bit about the family, a little bit about Oz and the story, but it also gets into a lot about psychology and how to use this to really explore yourself in your own journey. Do you want to give us a better elevator pitch than that? You know, one of the one of the ways that I work, I work with people around their dreams and around the imagery that comes up for them. And I have a whole collection of all kinds of little figurines. And of course, the Wizard of Oz figurines are part of that. But, but it's a whole wall filled with a little bit of everything in miniature of the world. And people can create scenes in, this, in sandboxes with, with those figurines. So Wizard of Oz imagery often comes up. It's so strong in the American psyche. And it's really strong around the world, but we really see it. Every day there's references to it. And it, it allows people to really express themselves and where they're stuck you know, depending, you can, you know, even as adults, you look at the movie or you read the book and you get captivated by a certain situation or a certain struggle that Dorothy's involved with. And to think then, how does, what's that representing in my life? How is this true about what's going on for me at this time in my life or the way I feel inside? So it's constantly uh, tuning you into what's happening in your inner world, as well as what's going on in your outer world. So it's fascinating. It's, it's really fascinating to start to look at, particularly this story, because it's so alive in our culture. It, it's really the quint quintessential essential American fairy tale. It's really our fairy tale, um, which is really different than fairy tales from other countries. So... Yeah, there's, there's a lot to say about it. I've, I do a fair amount of teaching of seminars of that and people, different therapists have, have developed different ways of working with it, with art, with journaling, um, all different ways that it comes up for, for use in the therapeutic world. And I do see someone is mentioning She Who Holds the Sky. And I know I have a copy of it somewhere. Yeah, I was going to mention that too. Sally Rose Wagner, oh, go ahead. her books are available through the Gage House. So if you look um, on the matildajoslyngage.org, you can find She Who Holds the Sky, which is a, bi a brief biography of Matilda, and also the wonderful Mother of Oz that relates Matilda to Oz. Um, there's a lot of publications there, pages of them. So be sure if when you go to the Gage website to look there and you'll find more sources too. She Who Holds the Sky is the name that was given to her. She was adopted into the Haudenosaunee clan of the Mohawk Nation. And that's the name that she was given. So that 
that particular book is a lot about her thinking that she uh, she learned by by her association with that culture, who were very matriarchal, and the women really had their own rights. They weren't possessions of the man like like we were for so many centuries. So uh, it's a really interesting piece to begin to understand Matilda's thinking and where her ideas came from and uh, how a culture, how a society can really exist in a much more uh, way that includes masculine and feminine rather than this male patriarchy that we've lived with for so many generations. I think that's the exact perfect note to wrap up on. And if we don't end soon, we won't have time for another comfort break. And I know Colin wants that. So thank you guys so much for talking with me. This was just a dream. And thank you everyone who's been listening. You've been excellent about using the chat and not chiming in. And I really, really appreciate it. So yay us, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Yay. All right, thank have a good day. All three of you, thank you so much. Um, yes, thank you guys. I, I, I One thing for me before you go off is if only we could have Matilda here and grill her and mm. ask the questions. That, yes. Do you know what I mean? It would, it would be a fascinating conversation. And Angelica, I'm glad that you have writing to keep you off your street, off the streets because you need to stay off my patch when I'm over for OzCon. <laughs> <laughs> You know, Sally, Sally used to do a performance where she became Matilda. And it was so fun because I got to ask all the questions that I'd been wanting to ask for a long time. So I can really appreciate that, Colin. It was really, it was really a treat when she did that. Angelica did a talk very similar to that. She was talking and she had someone dress up. It was Caitlin Master. I had I too. Oh, Carol yeah. Paul. Carol Carlson in um, Louisiana and Caitlin Masters in Pasadena. That's great. Fabulous. All right then, so for everybody, I'm just gonna unpin you all now. It is half an hour lunch break time. We've got another panel with John L. Bell moderating on a Ruth Plumley Thompson panel. So I'm gonna, I'm going to come out of Zoom, but I think you can all kind of still hang there if you want to chat. Mm -hmm. I'm not 100% sure. Um, however, if not, then you just need to dial back into this link that I sent to everybody earlier. Okay. Yeah, Thanks, you, Dina, for organizing can, them. Go on, Erica. You can come in and up. out of the chat all day as much as you want. So, which is good for me because this little one's starting to get kind of squirmy. <laughs> so hi baby so, so yeah it's basically up to you hey, guys i'm gonna go hey, off hi, for hi. half an hour but i will see you all ready for the next panel shortly so carry on enjoying oscom dina gita and angelica thank you so much for the extra work you put in in the build-up to the panel as well that was fabulous already thank you thank you thank you it was wonderful thank you have some books to read now. <laughs>